Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of World Panorama. Here we are getting you your weekly dose of major international news with a perspective. I am Sana Khan. Before we get you detailed reports, here's a look at the top stories this week. Former Pakistan President Parvez Musharraf ends exile and announces return to Pakistan ahead of elections. Nuclear talks between world powers and Iran resume. West offers Iran a deal, drops demand to close plant. Pope Benedict the 16th resigns papacy. Cardinals begin the long process of picking a new pope. And catch all the glitz and glamour and the big winners from the 85th Academy Awards ceremony coming up later on the show. This week, the focus is on the announcement by former Pakistan President Parvez Musharraf that he will soon be ending the self-imposed exile and return to Pakistan later this month. Former military ruler Parvez Musharraf, who has been living in self-exile for nearly four years, said on Friday that he would return to Pakistan within a week of the formation of a caretaker administration later this month. Now, he said at a press conference in Dubai that he planned to fly into either Karachi or Rawalpindi to end his self-exile. The Pakistan People's Party-led government, meanwhile, is set to complete its five-year term on the 16th of March, and the ruling party and the main opposition, PMLN party, have already begun negotiations in forming a caretaker setup to supervise the next general election to be held by mid-May. 69-year-old Musharraf, who stepped down as president in 2008 after he was threatened with impeachment, brushed aside questions on whether he would be arrested on his return in connection with several cases against him, including the case related to the assassination of former Premier Benazir Bhutto. An anti-terrorism court had declared Musharraf a proclaimed offender or fugitive for refusing to cooperate with investigators probing Bhutto's death in a suicide attack in Rawalpindi back in 2007, December. Musharraf has been since shuttling between London and Dubai after he went out of Pakistan in exile. What is required is a strong, stable government, a government which governs for the people of Pakistan, for their welfare, and shows honesty, dedication, and commitment. For this purpose, the prerequisite is to create a third political alternative. We have to bring about a political change. We have to break the political status quo and produce a third political alternative. It is in this area of creating the third political alternative that I think that my going back to Pakistan is essential. When should I go to Pakistan? And under the advice of all my party men, we have decided that as soon as the interim government is in place, which we hope will be on the 16th of March, within a week of that, I will go back to Pakistan. Well, to discuss the possible ramifications of Musharraf's return to home, I'm pleased to welcome Sandeep Dixit, senior journalist, with me in the studio this week. Thanks, Sandeep, so much for joining me on World Panorama. Now, I'd like to ask you, this is not the first time that Musharraf has expressed his desire, or even said out, uh, out loud in the media, that he would like to return to Pakistan, make a comeback in Pakistani politics, and he's used words like it's now or never, and Pakistan is at a crossroads. How do you view this statement? Well, uh, you've said it all in your earlier narration. There are a whole lot of hurdles that he faces. So if and when he manages to cross those hurdles, one, sticking to his annou announcement, as you said, he's announced previously also that he wanted to return, sticking to that, and then the pending cases against him, what happens to that? And then, of course, uh, if, he, if, 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 he, if he's allowed to contest, then he makes the contest all the more interesting over there. But on a more serious level, uh, mm. If Parvez Musharraf enters the fray and is a candidate and has candidates all over the country, then he risks uh, splitting what are known as the secular votes or the left and the secular votes, okay. which Parvez Musharraf represented. So far, the PPP had been sitting in a very good position. Hmm. It, uh, it and its partners, potential partners like MQM, Awami National Party, and uh, Baloch parties and even Musharraf's party, PMLQ, hmm. uh, they were thought to be commanding something like 40% of the 
uh, secular votes that are there in Pakistan. While the rightist votes were thought to be getting split among various people, there's this Qadri who's coming in, don't mm -hmm. know his political ambitions yet, Imran Khan's party, and then, uh, of course, Jamaat Dawa might support some people, Jamaat Islami, whole lot of people, PML, Nawaz. So uh, this makes the election contest all the more interesting. And as you've said that uh, he's had a very interesting career earlier. So he's made some enemies and he's made f some friends. So let us uh, see how this plays out. Right. He's also, in fact, said that he is going to come, uh, you know, during the interim government period over here. And he is planning to contest polls from one seat in all provinces. That's what he said. Uh, and in the capital territory of Islamabad as well. So uh, if you could just elaborate a little more on how equations are going to change once Musharraf steps in into Pakistan politics. Yeah again. You see, so far it appeared that his party, PMLQ, would be going along with PPP. Hmm. So there was an alliance kind of a thing happening, PPP, then there's MQM in Karachi and uh, Hyderabad hmm. and some other towns, and then there's this Awami National Party that is there in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and PMLQ bringing right. up the rear. So this was supposed to be a coalition uh, that would have sailed into the elections hmm. and then taken on other forces, main, the main force being, being uh, PML uh, uh, Nawaz Sharif and his uh, younger brother Shaba Sharif. And then there's jamaat -e islami and then there are a whole lot of religious party, a hmm. lot of them. And so it was thought that this right vote would have got split while this vote would have consolidated. So now we have to wait and see what this does. I mean, when Mr. Musharraf comes in, whether his erstwhile comrades in PMLQ will stick with him or whether they would try, uh, like to go with the tried and tested PPP, which has been in power right. and which has many attractions of being in power. Hmm. And then, of course, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are these cases against him. He's been wanted there and uh, he's not had a very good relation with the judiciary. And uh, in a place like Pakistan, uh, where uh, retributions are a bit faster, the judiciary would want to really ask him to give an account of his absence. Right. And in fact, things. I was just coming to that a few days earlier. Parvez Musharraf very clearly refused to appear before the Lal Masjid Commission as well. And in his press conference, he said that, you know, he has no such cases in court and he is ready to go uh, to Pakistan. Uh, there seems to be a strong possibility of arrest. And that's why perhaps he is uh, postponing his return to Pakistan. Ve uh, you know, there is a lot of curiosity amongst uh, watchers that what's going to happen once Parvez Musharraf lands in Pakistan? What is the possibility of him facing arrest? And we've seen a very tumultuous recent past in Pakistan where the judiciary is at constant loggerheads with the government. Yes, we have to see, wait and see, because uh, 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 as the situation now stands, uh, the fact was that uh, General Parvez Musharraf was a dictator. And so he has few friends. He does not have too many friends. Mm -hmm. The PML of Nawaz Sharif and others, they grew out of the army shadows long back and they are a force to reckon with in their own right. So it will depend as to how many people can align with him, but so far it will be a very lonely battle hmm. because even the PPP, for instance, is uh, an anti-army party. It does not like military dictatorships. Uh, its founding uh, lights, uh, Zulfikar uh, Ali Bhutto, hmm. became a victim at the hand of the army. And similarly, in Khyber Pakhtunwa, you have the Awami National Party. Right. Even they are not going to align with him. Hmm. So it will be a very lonely battle, perhaps, for him. Also, uh, wh what about uh, countries like the US and India? What should, uh, you know, what should they be looking at right now? Because obviously, we're talking about changing equations once Musharraf steps in. That's true, but uh, a country like India, to be frank, is very happy when it's not mentioned in Pakistan or when it doesn't become an issue in Bangladesh or in Nepal for that matter. Mm. So that way India is very, uh, India would like to watch from the sidelines, watch a free and fair contest. And I'm sure um, uh, in this elections, apart from combating terrorism in Pakistan, the other aspect would be economic development. Mm. And uh, when one talks of economic development, then one talks of linkages with neighboring countries. Mm. So I'm sure uh, parties on both sides of the divide, the left and the right, the secular and those tilted towards the religious, or whatever you may call them, they would want to have interlinkages, that is routes going into Afghanistan and connections with India. And in fact, to actualize what has been a long-standing uh, 
uh, Mekong South Asia corridor that connects all the countries together. Right. Because without that, as you know, there's no salvation for Pakistan. All right, so clearly Pakistan faces a lot of challenges at this point in time. The elections are right there with Parvez Musharraf announcing his comeback. The contest, as you mentioned, is going to get uh, very interesting. Pakistan is also uh, grappling with its internal challenges at this point in time. All eyes will be on Pakistan in the next few days to come. Thank you so much, Sandeep, for joining me on the show this week and sharing your perspective on the show. Thank you. With that, we are heading in for a short break. After that, a look at the Iran P5 plus one nuclear talks that just concluded in Almaty in Pakistan. Stay tuned. You're watching World Panorama. After eight months of diplomatic hiatus, Iran and the world powers, the so-called P5 plus one, were finally able to return to the negotiating table and, to the surprise of many observers, managed to pull off a potential breakthrough in the decade-long nuclear standoff. After two intense days of nuclear talks in Almaty, Kazakhstan, Tehran issued a statement that described negotiations as a positive step forward due to a more realistic position adopted by the Iran Six Nations that comprised the UN Security Council's permanent five members plus Germany. At the talks that ended, the six world powers offered to lift some sanctions. If Iran scaled back nuclear activity, the West fears could be used to build bombs. The E3 plus 3 has tabled a revised proposal, which we believe is balanced and a fair basis for constructive talks. The offer addresses international concerns on the exclusively peaceful nature of the Iranian nuclear program, but is also responsive to Iranian ideas. The sanctions are hurting Iran's economy, and Jalili suggested Iran could discuss its production of higher-grade nuclear fuel, although he appeared to rule out shutting the underground facility Fordow. The site of Fordow is a legal site. It is a site that the nuclear watchdog is entirely aware of and it is under their supervision and are monitoring its production. And its production is entirely in accordance with the framework of the nuclear watchdog and there is no justification for closing it. And this is not something that they had requested. Western officials had made clear they did not expect major progress in Almaty, aware that the closeness of Iran's presidential election in June is raising political tensions in Tehran and makes significant concessions unlikely. Both sides said experts would meet for talks in the Turkish city of Istanbul on March 18 and that political negotiators would return to Almaty on April 5th and 6th. Italy, for the first time in the past six centuries of the Roman Catholicism, a Pope appeared at his balcony, high above the throng, not to greet the faithful, but to bid them farewell. Benedict XVI renounced his office as Supreme Pontiff of the Catholic fold on Thursday, taking a step that few popes have dared in the 2,000-year life of the Church. His departure was characteristic of a man who thought in terms of centuries, but whose papacy was often swept up in the tumult of daily headlines. Well, now the attention shifts to cardinals who will forge Catholicism's future through one of the oldest traditions, a secret conclave to elect a new leader. The Catholic Church awoke on Friday with no leader following Benedict XVI's resignation in which he pledged obedience to his successor and described himself as simply a pilgrim, starting the final pilgrimage of his life. The doors of the 17th century palace were shut and the Swiss guards on duty at the main gate to indicate the Pope's presence were then quit their posts, returning to Rome to await their next pontiff. The Swiss guards stepped inside the residence, hung up their weapons and the doors were closed. Well, how do we feel? A bit nostalgic, but also a lot of happiness because of, as he said yesterday, to be in the church means also to take difficult decisions and this makes us happy and it comforts us because we know that he is living as a happy and contented man and strengthened. We just came from Castle Gandolfo and we saw his expression and it was one happiness. I didn't think about sadness or happiness. I thought about this historic moment, socially, economically and also religiously. Certainly, we are living in a very complex period with great challenges, but also a time of great possibilities. The 
With his resignation begins a period known as the Sedi Vacante or Vacancy, the transition between the end of one papacy and the start of another. During these few days, no more than 20, a few key players take charge running the Holy See, guiding the College of Cardinals in their deliberations and organizing the conclave to elect Benedict's successor. With Pope Benedict XVI now officially in retirement, Catholic Cardinals from around the world begin on Friday the complex, cryptic and uncertain process of picking the next leader of the world's largest church. We take an oath to do what is best for the church when we elect someone. So you take that then into prayer and uh, you sort the information through uh, and ask the Lord to help you to understand uh, from what you've been told, either through books or through contact, um, who will be the best candidate uh, who, for the church whom you're going to uh, uh, put on that ballot when you have to fill it out. Soon the cardinals will discuss how long they want to hold general congregations before going into the conclave. Nothing is set yet, but the Vatican seems to be aiming for an election by mid-March so the new Pope can be installed in office before Palm Sunday on 24th of March and lead Holy Week services culminating in Easter the following Sunday. Meanwhile, Italy's political stalemate has jolted the entire Eurozone, reawakening the Eurozone debt crisis from months-long democracy. Italy plunged into political crisis after one of the most inconclusive elections in its history. With all votes counted, the centre-left coalition, led by Pierluigi Bersani, won the lower house vote by the thinnest of margins, but fell far short of a majority in the Senate. The results of Italy's most inconclusive elections threw up Pierre Luigi Bersani as the sole winner but by the thinnest of margins. Now the prospect of a political paralysis looms large over the country. The surprising Italian vote left little clarity about who would form the next government. As no Italian party secured enough seats to win a majority in the country's upper house, the Senate, a political deadlock is widely expected as parties struggle to form a cohesive coalition. With the threat that Italians will likely return to polls in coming months, the outcome weighed on stocks around the continent. This would never have happened in other countries, the United States, England and France, where a similar vote would have anyway have guaranteed the possibility of government. But here it is not like this. And you can understand from this who wanted to stop the electoral law reform. It certainly wasn't us. I think the investors didn't expect such an election impasse where neither the left wing nor the right wing can control the parliament. The government cannot easily deduct its expenses and Italy needs further reform in the salary system, the labor market and so on. None of these reforms can be accomplished in a short time. It requires a common understanding of all parties. Reflecting the chaos, stock markets were jittery in Milan and abroad amid fears of political instability in the Eurozone's third largest economy. After surging in the wake of exit polls, Milan's main stock index slumped with the first projections before closing slightly up. I believe that the Euro rather leans towards weakness and that we have to fear that the Eurozone will be damaged irreparably. We have to state this very clearly. If Italy is ungovernable, that is the ultimate disaster. In der Tat, nicht nur verbale Roti sagen. The third largest economy in the Eurozone, Italy, has been hit by enormous debt and persistent slow growth over the last few years. The government has been forced to cut public expenses by a large margin to stave off recession. With so much on the line, an unwelcome election outcome has dimmed Italy's hopes for a quick economic recovery. Another short breather. After that, a look at the Academy Awards winners. Stay tuned. Thanks for staying with us. Now let's quickly get you a quick wrap-up of all the other major international news events in Globe Watch. A policeman died and 42 people were injured in Myanmar during a protest by farmers over what they said was a land grab by a private company, a growing source of tension as people assert their rights after the end of military rule. 27 police were among the injured on the sixth day of demonstrations in Maleto village track in the fertile Iravadi Delta, the rice bowl of Myanmar. The authorities had imposed a curfew in the area when the protesters became aggressive a day earlier. French President François Hollande on his 24-hour walking trip to Moscow met Russian President Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin on Thursday. 
The French president was expected to raise concerns about Russia's human rights but also to play down differences that might undermine trade ties. The French leader said he would also discuss with Putin foreign conflicts including Afghanistan and Syria, reiterating that Paris was respecting a European arms embargo to Syria. Officials from European Union, IMF and the European Central Bank met with the Portugal social partners as recession drags on for the third year. The review by Troika is likely to lead to a request by the government for budget deficit goals to be eased as deep austerity undermines fiscal performance for a second year in a row. Indebted Portugal is mired in its deepest downturn since the 1970s with unemployment at record levels, just under 17%, undermining consumers who face the biggest tax hikes in living memory this year. Extreme weather of snow, fog, gale and sandstorm swept northeastern and central and northwestern China affecting traffic and hampering people's daily activities. In northeast China's Jilin and Liaoning provinces along with North China's Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, airports and expressways have been affected by a heavy snowfall. Time now for all the sports news from through the week. Here's sports action. Rafael Nadal beat Argentine qualifier Martin Alund 6-0, 6-4 at the ATP Tour event in Acapulco on Thursday as he continues his rehabilitation from injury. The Spanish world number 5, playing his third tournament since returning from a seven-month layoff due to a knee injury, made short work of the first set, breaking his opponent's serve three times to take it 6-0. The Argentine fared better in the second set, Nadal breaking serve just once in the third game to go on and win the match in an hour and 25 minutes. 2014 Ryder Cup captain Paul McGinley admits he's under no illusions as to how tough a challenge he and his team faces. Following last year's thrilling comeback by the European team in Medina, the Irishman is well aware that the competition can rest on a knife edge. The visitors staged one of the greatest comebacks in Ryder Cup history when they won eight and tied one of the last day 12 singles matches to retain the trophy. World champion Jose Lorenzo and Yamaha Factory Racing returned to the top of the second of this week's three days of testing at the Sepang International Circuit on Wednesday. Lorenzo's fastest ever lap time at Sepang came in the first half of the day, with the Spaniard going round in 2 minutes 0.282 seconds, over three tenths of a second quicker than his compatriot and Tuesday's pace setter Pedrosa. Jimmy Johnson won his second Daytona 500 title while Danica Patrick finished 8th, the best ever finish for a woman in the Great American Race. Five times Sprint Cup champion Johnson led through the last 10 laps to finish ahead of Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Mark Martin. The race came a day after a crash in the second tier nationwide race at the Daytona International Speedway, left 28 fans needing treatment after debris flew into the crowd. In the world of entertainment, Ben Affleck directed Argo won the award for the Best Picture category, beating the likes of Life of Pi and Lincoln. 22-year-old Jennifer Lawrence was adjudged the Best Actress for her role as an emotionally unstable widow in Silver Linings Playbook, while Daniel Day-Lewis took home the Oscar for his portrayal of President Abraham Lincoln in Lincoln. Here's a look at this year's Academy Awards. <laughs> Aliens and robots? Yes, sir. You're telling me that there is a movie company in Hollywood right now? Argo, in which a Hollywood CIA. producer and makeup artist yes, helped engineer the rescue of six Americans What's from Iran, life? won the top prize at the 85th Academy Awards in Los Angeles. And now for the moment we have all been waiting for. And the Oscar goes to... Argo. Argo has seven Academy Award nominations this year, winning three Oscars. I want to acknowledge the other eight films. There are eight great films that have every right, uh, as much a right to be up here as we do. I want to acknowledge them and thank them for what they did and for the, many of them who 
who didn't even uh, uh, get nominated this year. Argo, which became the first movie to win Best Picture without its director being nominated since 1989's Driving Miss Daisy, collected two other Academy Awards for editing and adapted screenplay. But the evening's most recognized film was Ang Lee's Life of Pi, which won four Oscars for directing, visual effects, cinematography and score. And the Oscar goes to Ang Lee. <laughs> Lee's film came into the evening with 11 nominations, one behind Steven Spielberg's Lincoln. The film about the 16th U.S. president helped Daniel Day-Lewis make movie history as he became the only man ever to win three lead actor statuettes. To whom I owe this and a great deal more. Tony Kushner, our beloved skipper Steven Spielberg, and the mysteriously beautiful mind, body and spirit of Abraham Lincoln. 22-year-old Jennifer Lawrence nabbed the lead actress prize for her role as an emotionally unstable widow in Silver Linings Playbook and promptly tripped over her long dress walking up the stairs to accept her statuette. But the crowd was quick to give her a standing ovation. <laughs> you guys are just standing up because you feel bad that I fell and that's really embarrassing but thank you. Christoph Waltz. The best supporting actor was Christoph Waltz, who won for his role as bounty hunter Dr. King Schultz in Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained, while Anne Hathaway took home the statuette for best supporting actress for her emotionally raw portrayal of a doomed seamstress in Les Miserables. At the end of the day, she'll be nothing but trouble. It came true. <laughs> oh. And thank you for this. Here is hoping that someday in the not to distant future. The misfortunes of Fontaine will only be found in stories and never more in real life. Thank you. Alien. William Goldenberg was a double nominee in the film editing yes. category, having worked on both Argo and Zero Dark Thirty and won the prize for Affleck's CIA drama. Well, that's all we have for you in this edition of World's Panorama. I'll be back next week, same time, with more world news. Till then, you can join us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates from us. This week, we wrap up with some beautiful colors. The New York Botanical Garden was transformed into a wonderland of color as the annual Orchid Show blossomed in the Bronx. Goodbye and thanks for watching.